Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for day two of the Animal Care and Control Association of Tennessee Conference. Um, today, we have with us Dr. Kate Hurley. She began her career as an animal control officer in 1989. After graduating from the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine in 1999, she worked as a shelter veterinarian for two years before returning to UC Davis to become the first person in the world to undertake a residency in shelter medicine. She's now the director of the Corette Shelter Medicine Program at UC Davis. To learn more about her, please go over to the speakers tab uh, on the um, platform and check more out about her. Today, she's gonna be talking about housing, health, and well-being for cats. Welcome, Dr. Hurley, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. So good to be here, and um, welcome to all of you. I guess it's lunchtime where you are. It's, it's the beginning of the day where I am. Um, and also, welcome to the people of the future who will be, who might be watching this recording. Um, so good to spend a little time together, even if it's just virtually. My cat says hello. He knows when I'm on Zoom, and it's time to interfere with my work. Um, We'll go ahead and mostly hold questions to the end, but uh, if you have something urgent, put type it in the chat and uh, Michael's gonna be helping me keep track of that. So with that, let me get ready to share my screen. All righty, so. This actually works better on a bigger screen, but for those of you who are trying to look at this on your phone, this is a uh, the stories of the lessons that I've learned from feeling off a respiratory infection. This is more sort of, it's big picture stuff, but I think it's a really good illustration of so what shelter medicine is, what it needs to be in order to solve the really complex challenges that we face. And this is, so this is supposed to be sort of a David and Goliath thing where this is Hopefully you can see my mouse. This is a tab of amoxicillin and this is, I'm not trying to get this cat, I'm trying to get the upper respiratory infection that this kitty's got. Um, and it felt like, you know, at one time, all we had was just like a little tab of amoxicillin to throw at this sort of ubiquitous disease. Um, but this really could also be titled um, why I'm not a skydiver, because it really is just the story of how I have gone after what I thought was a solution only to be proved wrong again and again and again. So this is where I came from. Um, really, as a kid, I was a little unclear on what species I even was, um, whether I was a, a little girl or a little cat. And, and because my name is Kate, my nickname was actually Little Cat Hurley. And my mom indulged me like I was allowed to take my cereal on the ground sometimes when I was little. Uh, so not surprising that I grew up to work in an animal shelter. Um, so this is me more than half my life ago now, as Michael mentioned. You can see I still have the same. At that time, my, my other job was that I worked at a dog grooming salon um, and I got my hair cut there. That's a, a schnauzer puppy cut number four in case any of you want to replicate that look. Um, and now during the pandemic, I learned to cut my own hair with a little thing called a tinkle that you can get for... $3.99 on Amazon. Um, so haven't changed that much. But back then, um, this was a sign that held that that hung in the lobby of the, the shelter where I worked. And it was pretty typical of where the field was at in terms of, of outcomes for cats in those days. And it was true of our shelter. Um, that about one in every four cats that entered our shelter left alive. And that was that was true across the country. And in fact, we used to we used to sit around and pick pick which one of this litter of kittens we would keep. And so in light of that, I understood why it was my job if I picked up a cat that was feral or that was sick or was just too young. Um, it was my job to just march straight to the euthanasia room and euthanize that cat myself. And I did it because I understood that it was the best thing of all the difficult choices that we had. That was the humanest thing I could do. We also did wildlife rehabilitation at that shelter. So it was also me who picked up a sick and injured 
um, animals that have been injured or killed by cats. Um, we also, we're, we did animal control. We were responsible for resolving people's nuisance concerns. We were responsible for keeping an eye out for public health. Um, and so I understood that bringing in cats, even if we couldn't find homes for them all, was the best way that we could meet all the different goals that we had as an animal shelter. Um, until one day when I just couldn't do it. Um, I brought in a litter of kittens that were just a little too young to go out for adoption. And even though I was supposed to just euthanize them, we didn't have foster, wasn't really a thing in those days. They were so close to being old enough for adoption that even though I wasn't supposed to, I took them home. I put them in my bathroom and I decided I was just going to raise them a little bit until they were old enough and then I'd bring them back. And I'm tell terrible at naming. So I named them, uh, I named the Calico Cat Callie. And I named the three orange brothers, small, medium, and large orange, after the orange sodas of that name that they have at McDonald's that I liked. Um, and I brought them back to the shelter when they were old enough. And I set them all up cute, made a cute sign, like, I'm adorable, adopt me. And, and sure, and they beat the odds. Callie got adopted the very same day. She's so pretty and she kind of stood out. And within about a week, small and large orange also got adopted. Um, and I've told this story a million times, but there, there came a day about 10 days after I brought him back and I went into the euthanasia room and medium orange was on the table and he started to sneeze and we didn't have a vet. We didn't have an isolation room. And so we had a rule, one sneeze and you're out. And that was the only way we knew to keep all the cats from getting sick and then nobody would adopt from us and, and we would be able to save even fewer lives. And we had another rule that you couldn't question a euthanasia decision once it had been made. So I didn't say to my friend that that was my foster kitten. I didn't say that his name was medium orange. I just turned around and I walked out of the euthanasia room. And it was summer and the shelter had just opened and dogs were barking and the sun was shining and people were hustling around. And I stood with my back to the door of the euthanasia room. And I thought to myself, there has got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way of doing this than that this beautiful little kitten would lose his life just because he sneezed. And so, before long, I went off to vet school and I thought maybe there I would find that better way. And I learned a lot. And sheltering changed a lot during the four years that I was in vet school. And um, a lot more shelters were hiring veterinarians by the time that I graduated in 1999. And so I got a job right away in an animal shelter and we did have an isolation room and we did have medicine and we didn't have a one sneeze and you're out rule. And I was able to treat the cats that got sick. Um, but still, there came a day, and this is a picture of the actual hallway where my isolation room was full. And the hallway was stacked with crates and carriers with towels over them with more cats that had gotten sick with upper respiratory infection. And stray holding was full and adoption was full. And the choice that I was asked to make was, should we euthanize some of the cats we've already started on treatment that haven't gotten better yet? Should we euthanize some of the cats that just got sick that haven't even had a chance yet? Should we euthanize some of the cats in adoption that just haven't gotten chosen yet? Or should we euthanize some of the cats in stray hold that just came in? And I stood there in that dark, smelly hallway and I thought, there has got to be there has got to be a better way than this, that this disease makes decisions about cats that we don't get to make. And right around that time, I saw an article about this new program at the University of California at Davis that was gonna be a training program in something called shelter medicine. And so sure enough, I had the opportunity to go back to vet school and become the first person in the world to study 
this new thing called shelter medicine. I had three whole years where that was my only job. I didn't have to take care of animals. I didn't have to clean cages. I didn't have to do spay neuter surgery. I just had to learn about shelter medicine. And it was a tremendous opportunity. And even like the researcher who really did the initial work on feline herpes and Khaleesi virus, the two main viruses associated with feline respiratory infections, she shut down her lab in England for a whole day just so that we could meet and talk about your eye. And this is just a, a page of my research library, my resource library, all the articles that I read about feline upper respiratory infection. And I felt really smart. And I turned that into a PowerPoint. And the more I learned, the more slides I added to my PowerPoint until I had a wall of slides that literally took four hours to get through with all these different ideas for vaccination, nutrition, and handling and cleaning for how shelters could manage this nearly ubiquitous seeming disease. And did I solve it? Some of you know what comes next. This was a paper that was published over 10 years after I first stood outside that euthanasia room door, showing that still for all our efforts in a typical US shelter, there was a greater than 80% risk of upper respiratory infection by the time a cat had been in a shelter for two weeks or more, just like what happened to medium orange back then. So we went back to the drawing board. We saw that Morris Animal Foundation had put out a call for grant proposals specifically related to keeping cats happy and healthy in animal shelters. And so we decided to do a really big ambitious project to understand why respiratory disease occurred in the first place. We looked at 49 different factors, including cage size, what material was the cage, is stainless steel or laminate or what, hiding place or not, how cats were handled, whether there was volunteers, infectious disease control practices, vaccination, feeding, timing of spay neuter, air quality, natural light, dog exposure. And we collected detailed data for an entire year from nine North American animal shelters covering over 25,000 cases of upper respiratory infection and over a quarter million days of cat care. And even, this is actually a screenshot of some of the early data that we found. This is just one month, March. This one shelter had 49 cases of upper respiratory infection out of 184 cats they admitted. This other shelter had two cases out of 89 cats they admitted. Big difference in risk, right? And also a big difference in resource allocation. Here, they tracked how many cat days at risk. Those are healthy cat days. So that's a cat in the shelter for one day without upper respiratory infection. And then, and then how many sick cat days they had. That's a cat in the shelter who's sick. That's an estimate of resource allocation, right? They had 1,460 healthy cat days, 722 sick cat days. So about a third of their cat care resources being spent on this one disease. Even if it's not killing cats directly, it is costing money, it's costing time, and it's taking that away from the kind of preventive practices that they might really need to be investing in. This other shelter, over 2,600 healthy cat days, only 21 days. So less than 1% of their resources spent on upper respiratory infection not because they were euthanizing, because it just wasn't happening. So we took all that data, we put it into a giant computer. There was a kind of a grinding and a shaking sound and then out popped the result. And it was as simple as this. There was a 50 fold reduction in risk if cats had greater than eight square feet of floor space in the housing that they were in, in the first seven days of care. And if that floor space allowed separation so that there was one compartment that held their litter and a separate compartment that held their food and their bed. And importantly, this also allows the cats to be cleaned and cared for without having to remove them from the cage every day or have some whole thing happen where they're escaping and jumping down on the ground and running around and catching them. So really associated with much lower stress as well as fewer opportunities for disease transmission. 
and just a little bit more about feeling of a respiratory infection, we think about these two viruses, herpes and Khaleesi virus. And the general wisdom was that they were about equally responsible, both of them, for about half the upper respiratory infection that we see. And then there's a couple of bacteria, chlamydia and bordetella and mycoplasma that we also potentially see involved. But we wanted to know, was the shelters that had lower upper respiratory infection risk, could it be that maybe they were just taking in a healthier population of cats for whatever reason? So we actually cultured the cats at intake at a subset of these shelters. And we also cultured the cats when they had upper respiratory infection. So we wanted to see, was it that the cats were coming in with more of these viruses that cause upper respiratory infection? Or was there something that happened in the shelter that caused them to be more expressed? We've all gotten a lot better about understanding all this with COVID now, right? It's like, is it being transmitted more? Or is there actually a higher rate in this population when they're coming in? Now, herpes is distinct from the others in that it's specifically activated by stress in cats. So it's a sensitive marker of stress. And one of the primary stressors that activates herpes virus is pregnancy, birthing, and lactation. So that means that the majority of cats are infected by this virus very early in life. And it's just waiting and it lodges in the nerves around the nose and the mouth and the eyes. And that's why in cats, it expresses as a respiratory infection when it gets activated. And so no matter how clean you keep cats, no matter how careful you are about disinfection, you can turn it on just by stressing the cat out. And it turns out that putting a cat in a stainless steel box that's about two foot by two foot in diameter is a great way of stressing them enough to turn it on. So here's what we found in this graph. The blue bars are when they're admitted to the shelter and the red bars are when they have upper respiratory infection. So for the other pathogens associated with upper respiratory infection, we didn't see any significant difference in the frequency that we found them at intake by shelter. So it wasn't that some shelters were just getting healthier cats. And we didn't see any difference between how often we found that in healthy cats versus how often we found that in sick cats. And so that tells us Khaleesi virus, mycoplasma, chlamydia, that was not what was causing the upper respiratory infection that we were seeing in most of the shelters. What we saw was this giant increase in feline herpes virus. And so what that told us is that this is not a transmission associated disease. This is stress associated because if it was about transmission, we would be seeing Khaleesi, which is actually easier to transmit by problems with disinfection or problems with handling but all we were seeing was herpes virus, except at one shelter that had eight square feet of floor space instead of four and had double compartment housing that separated the litter and the sleeping area. And at that shelter, we actually found herpes virus a little less frequently in cats with upper respiratory infection than at intake. It just wasn't being expressed as an infection. And we saw a big difference in all of the other players associated with upper respiratory infection at a much lower rate overall. But those were the things causing upper respiratory infection because they were effectively shutting down feline herpes virus. Hope that makes sense. So we actually got another grant from Morris Animal Foundation to try this at home. And we partnered with Shoreline Steel to make a cage that met the, the dimensions that we had discovered in our research. This is our actual local animal shelter and this is the housing beforehand. So you can see, you know, pretty typical shelter housing of that time, food, water, litter box, hiding space, cat, not a lot of room. Here we have the same litter box, same food, water, hiding space, good cat and a little bit more room for the cat to move around. And we replaced, so we removed cages and replaced them over time. And here is what we found. The first bar is when there was all small cages. Then the second two bar is when we had a mix of small and the larger cages. And the final is when we had finally gotten to the point where we had all large cages. 
This is the percentage of adult cats that developed upper respiratory infection. So you can see it dropped by about half when we had all large cages. What did that mean? This is the number of healthy care days and sick care days. Now you're gonna learn more about the importance of the length of stay in Dr. Carson's lecture, which is um, later on today, I think just right after this. But this reflects again, how long are cats staying and how much is sort of the cost of care? And you can see that the number of sick care days drop by more than half. And also the number of healthy care days dropped because cats were moving faster because they were less stressed, they were showing friendlier behavior, and they were getting out of the shelter alive and more quickly. And so this is what live release rate looked like as a percentage of cats admitted. Went from 30% with all small cages to 50% with half as many, but twice as big of cages. So nearly double the live release rate. Still lower than we would want it to be, but um, considerably higher than it was. So let's take a closer look at what was going on. So we got a video camera that allowed us to video cats day and night. And this, is, this had never been done to our knowledge before. And so we got a 24 hour behavioral ethogram of exactly what cats did for their first day of care in the shelter. We actually tracked it for several days, but the data I'm gonna show you right, right now is gonna be, I think for the first day in care. This was really dramatic. This was the proportion of time spent in neutral, that's the blue, positive and negative behaviors in the large cage and in the small cage. So the amount of time spent in neutral behaviors was about the same in both, but far more time spent in positive behaviors in the large cage and far less time spent in positive behaviors in the small cage. I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures so you can imagine what that actually looks like. So for instance, a cat in a somewhat relaxed posture. So this is called what's known as a half meatloaf um, is the technical term. So the, the front paws are tucked under, the head is erect, but the back paws are splayed out. And that's a more relaxed posture than the full meatloaf where all the limbs are tucked under the cat. In the large cage, 71% of cats exhibited that behavior, whereas less than a third of them exhibited it in the smaller cages. And they also spent much more time in that relaxed posture. This is a more relaxed posture. And again, a dramatic difference, 67%. So over two thirds of cats exhibited this in the large cage and less than 15% in the small cage and less than 0.1% of the time did they spend in that relaxed posture. So just think about that, like the challenge that cats have in a shelter to like keep it together and show their best side and get somebody to, to notice them and think that like they would make a good pet. It's like if we were staying in a hotel and we had the challenge of like, be so cute and, and vivacious that somebody knocks on your door, asks you out on a date, and then by the end of the date proposes marriage to you. It's a lot easier to do that if you've been able to get some good rest in the meantime. And finally, this was a very simple, but really a profound thing. This chart shows the time to elimination. So urination or defecation in the small cages versus in the large cages. So within the first 24 hours, all the cats in the larger cages had used the litter box. Whereas fewer than half of them in the first 24 hours had used it at all. So I had this question like, where does this matter? Um, this matters in shelters, it matters in vet clinics, it matters in homes, it just matters for the well being of an animal that's so stressed that it's not able to even engage in this most basic of bodily functions. And other self maintenance behaviors like eating and grooming followed a similar pattern. So, this is the bottom line that we discovered. I'll explain this graph a little bit. This is a cat stress score. So these lines, the green line and the red line, represent where cats fell on the cat stress score. And this straight blue line represents the dividing line between frightened and relaxed. Now we allocated these cats at random to small and large cages. 
And you can see the stress, stress scores were very similar in the high frightened area for both cage types. But the cats in the small cage, this is day by day. So this is from day zero to day seven. So that for the full first week in care, they went, they relaxed much more slowly. And even by day seven, they had not quite crossed the line from stressed to relaxed. So what is that, you know, even let alone upper respiratory infection, what are the implications for how that cat presents as a candidate for transfer or rescue or adoption, right? What do we know about that cat's personality if it hasn't even gotten to the point where it can like take a nap or sort of groom or play in a relaxed way? Whereas the cats in the larger cages, just by chance, they happen to start out with a high, slightly higher stress score by day two they had reached the point of relaxation and then they just got more relaxed and they stayed relaxed. And so that played out in the number of cats euthanized who started out in the large cages, that's the turquoise lines, about double the risk of being euthanized if you just started your shelter journey at random in one of the smaller cages. So realized, Upper respiratory infection is not as simple as finding the right antibiotic or the right vaccine or feeding the right food. It has to be a bigger solution than that. But then the bigger solution, which is properly housing them, has more benefits than just preventing upper respiratory infection. Properly housed cats are healthier cats. They're also happier cats and they're cats that leave shelters alive. So thought, well, just give every shelter a big bag of money, have them redo all their housing and problem solved, right? Or, you know, <laughs> have a unicorn that poops rainbows because we just don't have big bags of money for all the shelters. Um, oops, I got a little out of order there. So um, I'm missing it. I'm actually missing a slide here, which is that we recognize we didn't have, you know, we didn't have the, the unicorn that poops rainbows, but what we did have was a thing called the portal, which I realize I'm just missing that slide out of this slide set somehow. Sorry about that. Um, but hopefully some of you have actually seen the portal. Um, and it is a, it's just a pass through that allows us to combine two housing spaces into a single housing unit for a reasonable amount of money. We don't have to spend $1,000 to get a new housing unit. In fact, we have the way to do it on our website that you can just use PVC pipes, but also you can buy these for about $150 um, and get this done. So we found a way that shelters could convert their existing housing into this housing that meets the guidelines. And type it in the chat if your shelter has done this. I imagine that there are some of you out there who have. Um, and I'll see if I get, I might have a picture of it somewhere else in this slide. But even with that, even when we had the solution of we knew how to do it, we knew how to make it affordable. And we marched around the country saying, yay, problem solved. These were some of the actual emails that I got. I have a board mandate to not euthanize for space, creating overcrowding, which causes us to end up euthanizing for disease. We're open in mission. Our policy is to euthanize for illness or aggression, not for time or space. Cats sit and get sick and get euthanized. Shelters at max capacity, I know we're euthanizing animals that arrived healthy and got sick due to overcrowding. Because here's the thing, this sign that I used to look at when I was first an animal control officer, this is against human nature. And it's really against the nature of the human beings that go to work in animal shelters because they care about pets and they want to save lives. And even for us, as hard as it was, it was still easier to let disease make the decision then walk through and choose amongst perfectly healthy kittens, which one 
is going to have to die today because there's more than we are able to place. And here's the thing that was happening. And this actually, this started to change in, in Nashville, Tennessee, um, from my perspective. Um, but in 2008, so now over 20 years later, if you know, from the time I stood outside that euthanasia room door, cat intake and cat live release were no better odds than they were at that time. We were still bringing in about four cats for every one that we released alive. And I went across the country and I, and I had a slide set, another slide set where I was like, people, you know, it doesn't matter how big you big the build the shelter. It doesn't matter how high you stacked the cats. It doesn't matter how small you make the cages. Ultimately, if you're bringing in more cats than you release alive, you're gonna have a problem. And here's the thing, the solution to that cannot be just euthanizing the cats before they get sick. Because even if we believed that was the right thing to do, we just, it's against human nature to be able to make those choices day after day, month after month, year after year, and still sustain the kind of staffing and support and engagement that you need to solve these problems in a deeper way. So we needed better math. I wasn't sure where that math was gonna come from. Until another day, when I was with a team from University of Florida and a few other shelter medicine folks, and we were consulting at the animal shelter in Jacksonville, Florida. And inside that shelter, whew, there was all the same crowding and euthanasia and stress and illness that I was used to seeing in those days. But on the loading dock, something different was happening. And it had just begun a couple of months before we arrived when feral cats came in in good body condition. Instead of being euthanized or held for adoption, they were sterilized and returned to the location where they were found. And you can see these, these lines here on this graph show their live release rate for the years before and then the year that they implemented that program. And you can see it hovered around 10%. The highest it ever got was close to 20%. Then they started this program in July and it jumped up for the first time above 20%. We got there in September and you can see after September, it jumped up a lot higher because we asked the question, well, if you're doing it for the ferals, why not just do it for any healthy cat? And so they started doing that. Any healthy cat that was brought in in good body condition that wasn't from an environmentally sensitive location or there was no particular danger or hazard at the location of origin was sterilized, vaccinated, ear tipped and returned. And this has become a familiar program now, but at that time, it blew my mind. It blew my mind in terms of the impact on live release, on shelter operations, and on upper respiratory infections. This is data from a different shelter, but sterilize and return was initiated midway through 2009 through 2010. This was the number of cases of cats that were euthanized for upper respiratory infection. And so you can see by the time this program was in full swing, the number of cats euthanized for upper respiratory infection had been reduced by over 90% from 900 to 90. So maybe drugs, vaccination, nutrition, ventilation, that wasn't enough. Even housing, it wasn't enough to solve the underlying math behind why cats got crowded and stressed in shelters. But maybe at long last, we had found the solution that was actually matched to the problem that was underlying everything for cats. And so I dove deep into this. I read a whole lot of articles about why this could possibly work, why this was better than the method that I grew up with as an animal control officer that I believe was so important to reunite lost cats with their owners 
to make sure that cats that needed new homes got good new homes, to make sure that we manage the harmful impacts of cats as best we could and reduce their, the impact on public health and on wildlife. So I spent a year or two really doing a whole lot of reading and research on this. And this is just like a few little screenshots of the articles that I read. But here are a couple of graphs that really struck me that came out of all that reading and research. One was, how do lost cats get home? This green piece of pie, this is the shelter piece of pie. Fewer than one out of 10 cats that is reunited with its owner is reunited by a call or a visit to a shelter. Subsequent research has shown that data to be closer to one in 50. So what that means is that we are reducing by 10 to 50 fold the likelihood that cats will be reunited with their owners by bringing them into the shelters versus returning them to the neighborhoods where they were found. Here's how people, how cats get new homes. Our piece of the pie now for shelters is a little bit bigger. This is about the proportion of, cat, of cats that are adopted through a shelter or a rescue. But again, the biggest piece of the pie is stray, friend and relative, or born at home. So non-shelter sources remain the most common sources for cats. And that's important two ways. It means that if a cat doesn't come into the shelter, that doesn't mean it's not gonna get a home. But it also means that most cats that are getting homes are getting homes outside of the shelter. And if we are busy and stacked to the ceiling with cats in the shelters, that's less resources we have to make sure that those cats getting out homes outside our system are getting vaccinated, are getting spayed and neutered, and the adopters are getting the information that they need to have a successful relationship with that pet. And here is where that is the most stark. About 25% of people who respond to surveys from the American Pet Products Manufacturing Association or the AVMA get their pet, pets from rescues or shelters. But clients of the Pets for Life program, which are by definition people in our most vulnerable and underserved communities, fewer than 3% are getting their pets from shelters. The vast majority are getting them from a neighbor or a family friend or as a stray or a found animal. So in the communities where people are likely to struggle the most to access those really important basic things like identification, vaccination, spay neuter, and where people might need some other support about information or access to other safety net services, we are not making that connection and adopting pets into those homes. And here's the bottom line at that time. This red, sliver was the sliver of cats that were impounded and euthanized, and the green sliver was the sliver of cats that were impounded and released alive. This is cats outdoors, the dark blue, and outdoor, outdoor unowned cats is the dark blue, and outdoor pet cats is the light blue. And so we looked at that and we realized like, whatever we do in shelters, it makes a huge difference for us and for the cats that come to us and for our ability to work with all those other cats outside of shelters. But euthanizing this tiny fraction of cats cannot be helping to control cat populations, to reduce their impacts on public health, to reduce their impacts on wildlife. And if instead of euthanizing them, we sterilize and return them, it will be way better for the cats, it will be way better for the communities, and at best it will create no more harm and actually may help stabilize cat populations. So Dr. Julie Levy, who heads up the University of Florida Shelter Medicine Program and I, went over those graphs at the Humane Society of the United States Expo Conference in Nashville um, a few years back. And we had the keynote talk at that conference. There was 1,800 people in the audience. It's the biggest audience I ever spoke to. And afterwards, I remember I was walking through the hall at that conference center. And somebody posted this quote on Facebook. It's impossible, said pride. It's risky, said experience. It's pointless, said reason. Give it a try, whispered the heart. And I took a screenshot of that quote on my phone as I walked in the hall after giving that talk with Julie. And I thought to myself, 
we're going to do something big for cats. And I'm going to tell people about this quote. And we did. We got a grant from Maddie's Fund. And we rolled out the Million Cat Challenge, which was a campaign. Hopefully, a lot of you have heard of it and a lot of you participated in it to help shelters save 1 million cats against each shelter's own baseline before joining the Million Cat Challenge. And the Million Cat Challenge was based around new shelter math that addressed that imbalance between the number of cats coming in and the number of cats leaving alive. That was really the underlying problem that was leading to euthanasia, that was leading to crowding, that was leading to stress, that was leading to too small of housing, that was leading to upper respiratory infection. And it was really about providing alternatives to intake. So helping people rehome their own pet or solve that problem with a litter box or get some food to carry them through until the next paycheck or until they sorted their, out their own living situation. It was about bringing cats in at the right time instead of when the shelter was full, waiting until after an adoption event had opened some space rather than having to euthanize. It was about capacity for care within the shelter, making sure that not only the housing, but the staffing was aligned with what the cats needed and optimizing length of stay, which will be the subject of another whole talk from Dr. Karsten. And then on the other end, it was about using that new program. We called it Return to Field then. Now I like the term Return to Home, recognizing that the community is often the cat's home, but also about removing barriers to adoption and making sure that all those people in underserved communities who want cats, if they want a cat from us, they can get a cat from us with spay neuter, with identification, with vaccination and all the information and support that they need. And um, the, the shelter, the city shelter in San Jose, which is pretty near where I live, was one of the early adopters. And this is a news article from early on in that, in that time, trying a new approach to dealing with feral and stray cats. Instead of euthanizing those that are adoptable, they spay or neuter them, put them back. And you know, this is what we've been talking about, right? But still, we see headlines like this, and I got questions about what about this? Must cats die so birds can live? That's a trade-off we would never make. We're not trying to choose one life or another, right? We are trying to choose identify something that values all life. And I understood sort of like, oh, that tiny sliver that we're euthanizing that we can't really make the difference. But it was fine. It was when we were driving along, it was, I was in a van with a bunch of people who were doing a, a shelter medicine fellowship. And I was explaining this partly for myself. Here's something that we know about all litter bearing mammals. They breed in proportion to the amount of resources available in the environment. So there's a saying, kill a coyote to come to its funeral. That's because when you remove one coyote, there's more food, litter size increases, there's more coyotes, right? And this is true for rabbits, it's true for raccoons, it's true even for birds, they'll have larger clutches if there's more resources and it's true for cats. So here was the thought exercise that we, that we did as we were driving along in this van in Wisconsin. Um, we know that about one in seven people in the United States feeds cats on purpose that they don't own. And we also know there are other food sources out there in the environment. So imagine for every bowl of food, a cat could have one kitten. And imagine there's, there's six bowl of food equivalents in this alley somewhere. Whether that's somebody putting them out on purpose or not, doesn't really matter. And imagine there's three intact female cats. There's an R on these because they're not vaccinated, so they could get rabies. And each cat on average gets two bowls of food. So each cat on average can have two kittens. There's an R and a T on the kittens. T is for toxoplasmosis. That is a disease that cats get the first time they eat infected prey. They shed for about two weeks and then they develop substantial immunity to reinfection. So that's a disease of young cats. So we have a risk of, of sort of six of rabies and toxo from these kittens. Now imagine we remove one of the cats. We could adopt her out. We could relocate her to a barn home. You could send her to my house if you had my address. Doesn't really matter. She's gone from the environment, but we don't have a one-on-one -on -one with the person who's feeding her or, or the open dumpster that she was eating from or whatever that food source was. 
So the food is still there. We didn't get all the cats, right? We only got one out of three. Too hard to get them all. And so the food is still there. Two cats are still there. They each can have larger litters. And we are right back where we started, which is what we had been doing in animal shelters for the 140 years that animal shelters have been around, right? We've been removing cats. And the next year, just as many cats, if not more, come in. But what if, now watch closely, this is a fancy animation I did. What if instead of removing her, we brought her in, sterilized her, vaccinated her, ear-tipped her, and put her back? No kittens, right? We don't know where the food was, but she does, and she just keeps on eating it. So there's no food extra for the cats that remain in the environment. And effectively, what we have done is reduce the carrying capacity of the environment so that now the next year, there's only four kittens coming into the shelter instead of six. And we can take the resources from two kittens and invest them in getting one more of those cats spayed. And then the next year, the next cat. And then we really have stabilized the population in the environment. So that's the theory. Here's the reality. Here's how it actually played out. In a large study, euthanasia reduced by 75%, not a surprise. Euthanasia due to upper respiratory infection down 99%. We talked about that. But here was kind of the big headline news. Cats picked up dead on the road down 20%. Evidence that there's just fewer cats out and about. An intake of both cats and kittens down by almost a third. Just sort of as our model would have predicted, with no change in intake or field services practices at the time. And these were not a fluke. These were repeatable results. An even larger program saw even larger decreases in the number, the number of cats picked up dead and the number of cats it admitted. And the thing is, I know all of you will be able to relate to this. It wasn't just about upper respiratory infection when we finally got at the root cause that we needed to address to solve that surface problem. Here's just one of the emails that I got. Our cat adoption rate went from 990 to 1,342. Our save rate went from 52% to 82%. We have a newfound vigor for our work. I recently presented our annual report and they were literally crying tears of joy at what we've accomplished. And I love bringing that back to the memory of my 24 year old self and what it meant then to work in an animal shelter and what it could mean. And so what I learned is that that promise that I made to Medium Orange over three decades ago was not my promise to keep and it was much bigger, much more complex, but also much more profound than I ever could have imagined. This is where the Million Cat Challenge counter stood a couple of days ago when I finalized these slides. 3,361,428 more lives saved by the 1,500 shelters in the Million Cat Challenge compared to each shelter's own baseline. And it was never mine to do, but it was all of you, it was all of us. It was shelters from the Southern tip of Florida to way up in Alaska. And I think a conference like this is the perfect place to ask yourself, what is that little whisper that's in your heart? What is the thing in this world, whether it's animal related or not, that you just know there's got to be a better way? And I encourage you to ask yourself that question and take the leap and let your colleagues and the people around you and the network of people who will be inspired and who will join in be the trampoline that will save you when you mess up. So thank you so much. 
happy to stay and answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Happy Hurley. Chat. Thank you. Do we have any questions? We have just a minute left. That was right on time. Just lots of thank yous. Thank you so much, Dr. Hurley. I've heard this presentation and you still make me cry too. So now I'm gonna go and conquer the world. So thank you for your energy. Uh, is there a website that you can give us? Someone's asking. A website for what? Um, I'm gonna put it in Hi. email. If you um, have any questions about portals or anything like that and shelter medicine com is the UC Davis Shelter Medicine Program and millioncatchallenge.org is where you can go to learn about the Million Cat Challenge. Um, and the quick question, offer advice on how you chose to keep certain cats available in the shelter. Really, the shelter should be for cats that for some reason, even the owners can't keep them, they're under six months old or there's some reason why they really can't go back. It's part of a hoarding case or it's an environmentally sensitive location, but let's save the shelter for those cats, even friendly cats, send them back where they came from. Somebody loves them, I promise. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Harley. Much All appreciated. Right. Bye All everybody. Right. Have a great have day, day everyone. Conference. Thank Tell Dr. you. Carson, I said hi. We will, bye-bye. All right, bye.